Good evening. A unique day in American history is ending, a day set aside for a nationwide outpouring of mankind seeking its own survival. Earth Day, a day dedicated to enlisting all the citizens of a bountiful country in the common cause of saving life from the deadly byproducts of that bounty. That was newscaster Walter Cronkite on CBS the evening of the very first Earth Day, 50 years ago in 1970. It's hard to believe we've had 50 Earth Days. Yep, and hard to believe it's been 52 years since the publication of one of the most famous environmental books. The Population Bomb, written by Anne and Paul Ehrlich. Famed Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich reflects on our current state of affairs and a lifetime of trying to turn the rudder of the good ship human civilization on this special Earth Day 50th anniversary edition of Growthbusters. Calling, 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 calling. Call a growthbuster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the Growthbusters podcast about sustainable living. We are deep into overshoot, so we're busy trying to save the planet. If we succeed, with your help, maybe there'll be something left for the next generation and the one after that. Sometimes we talk about simple things we can all do in our daily lives to shrink our footprint. Sometimes we dig into deep, heavy duty subjects like. It's been 50 years since the first Earth Day. What the f*** happened? I'm Dave Gardner, one of your guides on this journey to sustainability. And I'm Erica Arias, co-host and co-producer of the Growth Busters podcast. For cutting-edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. This special Earth Day episode is really extra special because we are joined by Stanford biologist Dr. Paul Ehrlich, the man who launched me on this path of planet saving. But before we talk to Paul, I have a couple of quick bits of news, Erica. We also want to do a quick follow-up on our last episode, 42, The Silver Lining of COVID-Induced Recession, with Brian Check, Executive Director of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. We discussed how reduced economic activity, like we're having now during the coronavirus lockdown, is actually a step in the right direction for preservation of our life-supporting ecosystems. Well, since we published that episode, Erica, two interesting commentaries have been published that are quite relevant, Uh, maybe even three that we should talk about briefly. But uh, we're going to try to keep this pretty quick because we know everybody's waiting to hear from Dr. Paul Ehrlich. There's one that I hesitate to even mention. I really hate to give it any oxygen. It was called Beware the Left's Degrowth Movement, and it was written by Stephen Moore. He's got a syndicated column, which is a tragedy in itself. (laughs) Uh, Agreed. uh, And that name may ring a bell to you. Stephen Moore was floated for a while as potential Fed position. Donald Trump wanted Stephen Moore, but the guy just lacked qualifications, and eventually they had to pull his name. He basically works for these think tanks that are uh, propaganda machines for growth pushers and growth profiteers. So this piece, Beware the Left's Degrowth Movement by Stephen Moore, we just want to issue a warning about, I guess. And you know what? I remember, Erica, the evening that I first read that, I sent you an email with a link to that. And <laughs> Boy, I got your attention. (laughs) If you know me, you know that I growl when I get mad. And this article definitely deserved a few growls from me. (laughs) I found it hilarious how Stephen Moore, who's supposed to be, you know, sort of a big deal out there in uh, his area. I thought it was really funny that he refers to the degrowth movement as sort of this chic fad, as if environmental protection, which is the quintessence of the degrowth movement, somehow became fashionable. Sure, let's go ahead and talk about how sexy climate change is and all the catastrophe that's happening because of the climate change. Let's go ahead and talk about how sexy that is. People started caring about the planet a long time ago when it became apparent that there's an Everybody else's health and social well-being are actually dependent on the planet's ability to support. Kind of what Earth Day is all about, in fact, because that was kind of the peak of environmental care. Little did people know back in 1970 that it was peaking. They thought it was just beginning, and we should talk about that a little bit. So we will include a link in the show notes to this piece of garbage. And if you do go and read it, be sure to scroll down and read the notes, because there are some good notes. And in fact, Brian Check 
who was our guest on the last episode about the silver lining of the COVID-induced recession, uh, Brian Check wrote a comment to that piece that made a very good rebuttal, and it didn't take him long because the truth is this thing is just full of unsubstantiated generalizations, wouldn't you say, Erica? Yeah. But there's hope because (laughs) we got the antidote. And shortly after I sent you the link to that, I sent you a link to this really amazing and wonderful essay that we cannot recommend too highly. We're going to definitely put the link in the show notes and well, whatever I can do to star it and highlight it and bring it to your attention, I will. And we have to sell it because it's, uh, I don't know, it takes a little while to read. I took a little bit of time reading that myself. It's titled The End of Economic Growth by, I'm going to butcher this, Sarmishta Subramanian. 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 Yeah. Somebody awesome. <laughs> yeah. Somebody I'm going to start worshiping. So a shout out to you, Sabramishta, and forgive us for butchering your name, but boy, we we love you and your work. And this is actually going to be in the May print issue of McLean's, which is a big magazine in Canada, but they posted at uh, mcleans.ca on uh, April 15th. And we will put a link in the show notes. So online, it's called The End of Economic Growth. And in print, the headline is The Death of Growth, I think. We've kind of already have seen that disasters have a way of slowing climate change, not to mention slowing down our economy. And when we also start to see oil prices decline and suddenly there's no more funds available to invest in all of these green technologies that all of our techno enthusiast friends have been raving about. What do we do? What are we left with? Is technology still going to save the world? Is it saving the world right now? It's kind of a really scary time that I hope more people are starting to question whether that is going to be the fix for everything going forward. And another positive thing I took from this article was Just hope for the future where people begin to see how one person's or even just a group of people's misfortune, collective misfortune affects all of us, right? Economically, health-wise, and now more than ever, those most vulnerable to climate-induced catastrophe. While this might seem like it's such a faraway problem and that it doesn't directly affect us, I hope that we're starting to see that it really does. It really does. And it's only a matter of time before it, it does directly affect us. I think what excites me most about this is this is a really good, uh, almost like a little mini course for for people with a short attention span, or if you you don't have the time or you can't find a good semester-long college course in real economics that uh, understands that the economy is a subset of the environment, this is a good primer. She talks about Paul Ehrlich, uh, Limits to Growth, Vaclav Smil. And I think one of the most important things in here is this notion, and apparently more and more economists and other smart people are starting to talk about the fact that, you know what, economic growth is slowing down. And maybe that's just a normal part of the process. Maybe that's a sign of a a mature economy. In fact, she mentions a a book called Fully Grown, Why a Stagnant Economy is a Sign of Success. Imagine that. I mean, this is blasphemy to somebody like Stephen Moore. But this is intelligent. This isn't full of unsubstantiated generalizations. This is a really good piece that's uh, required reading. So if you're a little bit new to the idea that pursuit of robust economic growth is a suicide mission. This will be a good primer for you. If you've been following along with uh, what we've been talking about for years now, and this isn't a new idea to you, this is something you can share with somebody who might be rational enough and open-minded enough that you can say, that's what I'm talking about. Speaking of suicide mission, I thought it was interesting she brought up a book that was published back in January titled The A Human Manifesto by a British academic named Patricia McCormick. I want to check that out. I was unfamiliar with that. Same here. I kind of stalked her a little bit um, after reading this, but really interesting. I believe she's a philosopher in the UK. She basically states that the best way to correct havoc wrecked 
by population and economic growth is for humans to stop reproducing. Imagine that. So this is interesting to me for obvious reasons, (laughs) just as a child-free woman. What a concept. Right. And they call it sort of this deceleration of human life and an end to the Anthropocene. It marks a leap in climate change activism. And I think that's really interesting. I was also very curious to see the reviews of this book on Amazon. So I read some of those. Very surprised to see a lot of really positive feedback. It's it's a conversation starter. And I think um, that's really her intention. I think that's really every academic's intention. It's not to impose their ideas on everybody. It's just sort of um, a space where they can... Hmm put their ideas and maybe some people will pick it up and think that that's cool and it might create social change one day. But I thought it was really interesting just as a child-free woman and as somebody who's interested in that connection between environmental and population sustainability and our personal reproductive choices. So yeah, that's kind of what I had to say about it. Maybe she'll be a future guest. That was my thinking. Yeah. Okay. One more essay that I think you wanted to. Yeah, sorry, guys, we are bombarding you with news stories today. But this one I thought was just really too special to miss. If we haven't already brought it up, I don't think we have. It was written by Dr. William Reese. He was the advisor to another really amazing person who is Mathis Walker Noggle. Yeah, the, and together, the two of them are credited as co-originators of ecological footprint analysis. They both wrote the original book. I think it was called Your Ecological Footprint. Yeah. Really smart guy, professor emeritus now at uh, University of British Columbia. So if you really want a definition of somebody who's a big deal, this guy is it, not Stephen Moore. (laughs) This guy actually does know what he's talking about. I would say, yeah, he's kind of a BD in my book. The title of the article I'm referring to is The Earth is Telling Us We Must Rethink Our Growth Society. And this was published back... About the 6th of April, I think. Very recent. I just want to say that I thought that this article was, it's an understatement to say how well written this was because it just points to so many of the truths I think that are really hard for your average consumer or person in the U.S. to really objectively look at and consider as our reality. People don't want to believe that there are no exceptions to the fact that any unconstrained expansion of any given population ultimately will lead to our collapse. We do have limits to growth. And he says that very clearly in this piece. And another point I want to make is how this pandemic has really flooded our mainstream news stations and papers and online articles. It's everywhere. COVID-19, COVID-19, but Mm -hmm. very, very little, if any at all, especially not on television, are we seeing a connection between COVID-19 and the climate crisis. And that's insane to me because months before (laughs) before this, this crisis hit, that was all we were hearing about. Climate this, climate that. The election is coming up. And who's going to take care of climate? Who do we want to vote for? Because who's going to take care of all these issues that we care so much about? Now nobody is talking about climate. And I don't understand how that is, how people are not drawing that connection. You know, what you're seeing on CNN and uh, the other mainstream media is all really kind of tunnel vision focused on something that's important, which is surviving this one. So far, there's not been, maybe there's not been time, although there's just so much repetition, you'd think they could get into it, which is to really explore, okay, what have we got wrong? What got us here? And it isn't just selling these exotic animals in wet markets. That's a small part of it. Banning those won't fix that. And so Reese goes into some of the other things about urbanization and density. and uh, That all connects to population and the whole environmental crisis. Yep. So that's The Earth is Telling Us We Must Rethink Our Growth Society, Why COVID-19 Previews a Larger Crash, What We Must Do to Save Ourselves, by Bill Reese, William Reese, in the TIE, and uh, there'll be a link in the show notes, and this is also required reading class. (laughs) As if we haven't made you wait long enough, there are a couple of other things that I do want to mention, and then we really will unleash the great, infamous, uh, legendary Paul Ehrlich on you. Because this episode is publishing on 
the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, April 22nd, 2020. It's a big deal. It's a big week. And of course, most of the world is sheltering in place. So we have more time to binge watch. And everybody by now is probably already screamed through all of the episodes of The Tiger King, for example. <laughs> we're going to do you a couple favors and give you some really meaningful content. So we're going to make the Growth Busters documentary free for a week, starting today. Nice. So look in the show notes for a link or head over to growthbusters.org and I'll try to make sure that there's a link on the homepage or look for the Facebook event page because by the time you're hearing this, there will be a Facebook event page for the free week of the Growth Busters documentary, which is kind of relevant to Paul Arlick because after he saw it, he wrote, this could be the most important film ever made. Wow. Seriously. It's quite an honor. Yeah. I don't think many people have directed a film and have the legendary Paul Ehrlich say this could be the most important film ever made. At like that this. point, yeah, I figured, you know what? Okay, I'm done. I've died and gone to heaven. Bragging rights. Well deserved. <laughs> There's no place to go but down after that. After that. <laughs> it really was. It was so meaningful. And uh, that's not why we're bringing Paul back today. Uh, I just have so much respect for him. And certainly it's not like I owe him. I mean, in a way, we're kind of just a pest because Paul, uh, even though he's retired now, he's busier than ever. And it's really pretty challenging just to find an hour of the day to have a conversation with him. The other bit of news is that also this week we're going to make the Growth Busters webinar series, which is normally available only to supporting members of Growth Busters because we're a scrappy little nonprofit that needs a little bit of revenue to keep the lights on. Uh, we're going to make that free to everyone. So the archives of the Growth Busters webinar series, normally behind a paywall for supporting members, we're going to bring that out forward and we'll give you a few more details about that at the end of this episode, but also see the show notes for a link so that you can watch those uh, webinars with your kids even. Well, thanks for that, Dave. Now, I think it's time to go to Paul Ehrlich. As Dave has mentioned, we spoke to Paul on April 10th, 2020. And this conversation warrants a disclaimer. Paul didn't get to be a lightning rod for heavy criticism and praise in the long-running debates about the unsustainability of economic and population growth by being wishy-washy. Outspoken doesn't even begin to describe him. That's for sure. And while we try not to get too political on this podcast, Paul has plenty to say about our current U.S. president. <laughs> yep. So if you just can't handle criticism of Donald Trump, then I'm sad to say you had best skip this episode because we really want to capture the real Paul Ehrlich in this conversation. So we're leaving him uncensored, unchecked. And we enjoyed every minute of it. This is a guy who almost needs no introduction, but Paul Ehrlich, uh, being professor of population studies, now emeritus at Stanford University, founded the Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford and served as its president. He was a guest on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson some 20 times. I'm sure that's more than any other scientist in the history of man. He's been excoriated by growth pushers and profiteers for over 50 years, and he has lived to tell about it. Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. It is a privilege and an honor to get an hour of your day. Ah, it's my pleasure. I never imagined I'd be super busy when I'm almost 88 and retired and thought that I would be just lying around reading good books, drinking good wine, chasing good women, you know, doing the things that us <laughs> retired folks ought to do. Retired? I haven't seen any sign of that. <laughs> but it's official, huh? Uh, all I don't do that I used to do is meet classes. But of course, now they aren't meeting classes. I get about 200 emails a day from Stanford University explaining all the procedures and so on. It turns out the university is going to partially shut down, but nobody would notice the difference because it still isn't doing anything at all to solve the problems you and I have been concerned about for all these years. The, the universities and I say the same for Harvard, Yale, et cetera, are still behaving as if their structures created by Aristotle are still wonderful and uh, not teaching. We Well, good lesson today. Some of you may have heard there's a pandemic going on, and it's crystal clear that many of the educated people in our country do not understand what exponential growth is. 
You know, it's a beautiful example of the failure of our educational system right up through graduate school. It is a pretty graphic uh, real life demonstration going on right there, isn't it? Your mention, Paul, of Stanford makes me want to jump ahead to a question that I was going to save for if we had time. And that I'm just going to jump on to it. You've retired recently from teaching at Stanford. You have been at Stanford forever for your entire, pretty much your entire career. Yeah, I came here in 59. Yeah. You've been pretty outspoken. You're kind of a bad boy in a lot of ways. Stanford, I want to know, why did they keep you? This is the place where they have the Hoover Institution yeah. and they have Paul Ehrlich. Well, I can give you my own theory, but there's a large literature. Excuse me, I always need a little gin when I'm doing these things. <laughs> I was um, hoping for that. <laughs> the Stanford was pretty much of a finishing school early on. And in the 50s, a president named Wallace Sterling came in and he had a very bright provost he appointed uh, named Fred Terman, who was the son of the Stanford Binet IQ test Terman. And uh, they decided to turn it into a really world-class university. And they knew that they couldn't at the time compete with places like Harvard, Yale, uh, in terms of money. Uh, so what they decided to do was build some, what they called, I believe it was steeples or pinnacles of excellence. They would hire groups of really good people in certain areas and build the university's reputation around them. And it was in part in science and engineering. Terman was an engineer. That's where Silicon Valley uh -huh. came from and yeah. so on. Uh -huh. Now, I was outspoken. Uh, on the other hand, in those days, a fair number of Rich people were concerned about the population problem. They were concerned because there was going to be too many people of the kind they don't like. It was a very racist thing. But bringing in the environment and so on was not really threatening to the establishment that runs our country, to the corporate bosses hmm. and so on. And also, the last thing Terman or Wallace Sterling wanted was a fuss with a loudmouthed young professor who they were trying to shut up because you don't build steeples of excellence and hire excellent people if you have the reputation for not letting them say whatever they think. So I think they thought I was, if anything, possibly a little positive, but certainly trying to stamp on me was not a price uh, that they wanted to pay, particularly since all my colleagues in the department were on my side. I mean, Don Kennedy, who later became the president of the university and was head of the Food and Drug Administration. Last 10 years of his career, he was the editor of Science, really big deal. He read the population bomb for me and has acknowledged in it, as are a whole bunch of other important people. So I was pretty well armored against any flack and, in fact, got none. I have to say, I've got wow. my complaints about Stanford, as you just heard. Yeah. Uh, but Stanford has been an ideal place for me. They have never tried in any way. When I went on TV and called Richard Nixon a crook, I didn't get a peep out of the administration, particularly because most of the people in the administration thought he was a crook, too. And, you know, you were on The Tonight Show probably more than any other professor in the country at the time. I did something like 20 of them, but... Carson, they, again, tells you about power relations in our society. Carson got the population. The book was sent to him by Arthur Godfrey, who was a very well-known celebrity at the, the time. He and I share being pilots. And Carson was really interested in the issues. More importantly, he was arguably the most important personality in Hollywood. Ann and I had dinner with him and Joanna one night in one of the fancy Hollywood restaurants. Everybody who came in <laughs> felt necessary to come over to John's table and make obeisance of some sort or another. And he was not a, uh, uh, he was a relatively shy guy, very nice guy, very, very, very smart. He was the easiest person to work with on all the time I did on TV, and I was a correspondent for NBC News and so on. John was a pleasure to work with always. 
Yeah, and I hadn't realized that you had that stint as a correspondent. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, Sam Hurst and I, and a photographer uh, named um, Hathaway, Keith Hathaway, did a series of bits over a three-year period for the Today Show. And we did things on uh, the cattle industry and so on and so forth. Made a lot of trouble, got, I think, an Emmy nomination for it. But we go in the field. I would tell Sam about what I thought we ought to do in science. And he was, he is very, very smart, still involved in um, trying to show people what's happening to Native Americans and so on. And he would design a shoot. We would go and I controlled the science. He controlled how we did it. And Keith Hathaway did brilliant photographic work. So the three of us traveled around the world and we take months to do something that showed for five minutes on the Today Show. But it was very nice to see the inside of the workings of NBC. Were there any challenges there with censorship? Oh, not with, well, the bigwigs weren't happy with what we did, but the same sort of thing. They wouldn't challenge Carson and they wouldn't challenge the people that were doing the Today Show when it was a very popular show. But there was a lot of Mickey Mouse going on all the time. The uh, battles between who was going to be the person running the show and so on. And Sam finally got so disgusted with NBC that he went into bison ranching. (laughs) So (laughs) that can show you what a talented person in TV finally gets fed up the the trivial battles and the nonsense uh, and the attempts for control from above. But I didn't, Sam, who had been in as a combat correspondent in Vietnam, did not take things lightly. And that's probably why we eventually got canceled. I'll I'll tell you one quick story. We were filming uh, in Arizona on the destruction of the Western areas by overgrazing with cattle. People who go to a place like Arizona and New Mexico think it's normally barren like that. But of course, originally, uh, the grass came up to the horses' bellies and more. And so we snuck into a fenced off area and we're in an arroyo filming the uh, place which is covered with cow pats and there wasn't a green blade of anything visible. And along comes a cowboy with two six shooters on a horse, followed by a pit bull. And uh, my instinct was to run, but Sam goes goes up and gives him a big smile. He says, what are you fellas doing? And and Sam says, we're photographing the wildflowers. (laughs) And he says, oh, really? And he looks around, it's not a blade of grass, not a flower, nothing. And Sam says, would you like to be in the shot? And the guy says, yeah. He says, you just ride off there into the sunset and we'll film you as you go. And the cowboy rode off into the sunset. I was really relieved. <laughs> oh. So we had, we had good time on our shoots. And I, I don't see much of Sam anymore, but he was a great guy to work with. He wrote a book called The Man with a Rattlesnake Under His Hat about the... Um, snake exhibit in the uh, the reptile exhibit in South Dakota, in the Black Hills. Great book. And I don't have any financial interest in it. I'm just boosting it. Paulo, I kind of want to just go back to the education system for a little bit, um, mainly just as someone who will be starting graduate school soon. It was really hard. It was really hard finding people who were interested in studying the relationship between population and the environment. And, you know, in my search, a lot of the articles that I was finding were coming out of just Australia or other parts of the world, but not here. Not very many people are talking about it. And when you bring it up, it's sort of unwelcome. But I guess as somebody who's wanting to study this this topic, um, do you have any advice or? Well, The universities themselves are not usually focused in the right way, but at all universities, like at Stanford, but and certainly at Stanford, there are a whole bunch of people who understand the world and are desperately trying to fix 
something in it. But the whole structure of the university is designed to make that difficult or impossible. The departmental structure, which runs almost everything in most universities, is based on the ideas of an old friend of mine that you may have heard of, but probably didn't meet, a guy named Aristotle. <laughs> uh, he wrote books a while ago. You can't name a standard department in which you could study any of the major problems of humanity because it will overlap the edges of the department. People say, well, what you need is interdisciplinary work between departments. But the money and the perks all flow down departmental lines. So when they establish interdisciplinary programs, they generally don't do much. It's certainly characteristic of Stanford. We have brilliant uh, environmental scientists here doing great stuff. But we, don't, we have a, uh, an interdisciplinary program which doesn't do anything. Uh, I mean, the, the people in it do things, but as a program, it doesn't do anything. And it there doesn't do what needs to be done. That is, every incoming freshman, if they haven't had really uh, good environmental education and mathematical education through their entire L high system, doesn't you can get all the way through Stanford and not have any idea what an ecosystem service is, what the second law of thermodynamics tells you about your life, uh, how many people there are in the world, why the human population has grown so much, what the food situation is. None of those things you can find out about them if you pick the right course and the right professor to work with, but you'd never get it just coming in at random, going through the standard curriculum in some department. And my advice to you is very simple. You want to go for a PhD program? I got into the University of Oregon's PhD program. So I'll be working with Richard York, who is actually very supportive. Of no, no, I, I know his work uh, very well. And you've done the right thing. What I was going to recommend is make a connection with a faculty member before you choose the university because the name of the university is nowhere near as important as who you are working with in it and what his reputation is. And so you've picked exactly the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's also a nice place to live as opposed to say the Northeast where I once lived, but fortunately fled. <laughs> where did you go? I was an undergraduate at Penn. Ah. Then I did my graduate work at the University of Kansas. Why at the University of Kansas? Because they had the best person working with insects, which is what I wanted to do in the world at that time. He was a guy that I had met in the American Museum when I was 15, and we remained friends to a couple of years ago when he died at the age of, I think, 95 or 96. So it's, we, I had that long a relationship with my major professor. We remained friends for he was, what, 29 or something when I met him or uh, when I was 15. And uh, I've been following him and corresponding with him and seeing him periodically ever since. Form a strong bond with your major professor. I hope you've met him. Yes, uh, yes. He is a nice guy from my memory of him. He's really nice. Yeah. yeah. The whole department. It was really a great, great experience. It's like joining a family. Yeah. You can divorce <laughs> a dozen husbands but you'll never get rid of your major professor. Just remember that he'll be <laughs> a factor in your life forever. People will be asking him about job recommendations and so on for you forever. Right. <laughs> yeah. I like to use that analogy as well. This is um, probably the only marriage I'll have in my life. <laughs> so. <laughs> hmm. so Paul, you mentioned your interest in insects. Were you chasing butterflies as a kid? You were kind of a scientific prodigy, weren't you? I, well, I don't know if I was a prodigy. I got very interested. I was interested in nature, mostly from being in summer camps. My parents sent me to summer camps uh, in a YMCA camp originally in central Pennsylvania. And I liked the nature stuff. And then I got introduced to butterflies and butterfly collecting. And that hooked me. The combination of aesthetics and scientific interest and being able to study the different patterns on their wings. As somebody once wrote, and I can't remember the quote exactly anymore, but it's sort of like the entire evolutionary history of butterflies is written in the patterns on their wings. Mm -hmm. And you can see those patterns very easily. 
and they turn out to be the most important organisms for studying evolution in nature because unlike fruit flies, which you, I've worked with and can be very useful, you don't know in nature when you see a fruit fly what fruit fly it is. But with butterflies, you not only know what butterfly it is, what species it is, but you can write a number on its wings and follow it around. I've probably written more numbers on butterfly wings than I've drunk glasses of wine, which is an incredible number of butterflies marked. <laughs> wow. Butterfly graffiti. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know too much about butterflies. I think I, I know more about moths and evolutionary reasons for why they change color. Oh, the pepper moths. Story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a standard story. You, wanna, you see, you, you don't really have to say... I don't uh, know butterflies. I just know moths. Butterflies are just day-flying moths. They're a group of moths that manage to get into the daytime niche primarily by becoming poisonous. They're distasteful, and so they're more readily protected from being eaten uh, than the average moth is. Oh. If you're into moths, you're into butterflies automatically. They're just moths. And more beautiful. <laughs> uh, listen, there are some gorgeous moths. I can, unlike butterflies, I have watched maybe 5,000 moths on a sheet in New Guinea with a black light and seen maybe there are four or 500 species there with incredible patterns, incredible different poses when they land. Uh, uh, hawk moths are gorgeous and fascinating. No, I could get into moths if I started all over again, but butterflies have the advantage for me of great amateur interest. Yeah. In fact, the single best paper I was ever involved in in science was based on citizen science, that is, on the huge number of people who collect and study butterflies, because they all want perfect specimens for their collections. And the way you get perfect specimens that haven't been flying around and had scales knocked off their wings and so on is by finding the caterpillars, raising them, watching the pupa, the resting stage where the caterpillar turns into the butterfly, and then when it comes out, wait till its wings are dry and then kill it and put it in your collection. <laughs> but in order to do that, you have to know what plant the caterpillar is going to eat. And when you find that out, you publish a little note in an entomology journal. And as a result of the amateur effort, we know more about the diets of butterflies than of any other large group of organisms of any kind. In other words, the work that Peter Raven and I did on coevolution was based on the efforts of amateurs. Knowing what's happening to the insect population out there, I'm feeling guilty about having chased down butterflies with a net when I was a kid. I mean, and what you just described sounds terribly brutal today. You say you feel a little guilty about the insects? Well, do you? I mean, it's probably hard to study them without... I mean, a lot of things that you study, you don't have to kill. For most of my studies, I didn't kill. For most insects, you're not likely to damage their populations severely, even by killing some of them. There's, they're short-lived as adults, and they uh, can build huge populations easily. But of course, for instance, the populations I studied most intensively for half a century or so on Stanford's campus, we would occasionally take an individual, but 99% of the ones handled were given a mark and released. And that's virtually what I did. But I had no compunction about making collections when I did and where I did, particularly compared to spraying the world with pesticides and disrupting habitats and plowing things down. In most cases, the activities of collectors are not important, but they can be, depending again on the population and so on. I think it's a, a nice trend started not by me, uh, I can't remember the names of the people who did it, but is moving away from collecting butterflies and photographing them. Yeah. And I think that's a generally good thing. It's like when I walk outside here now, in our, I live in the Drool Farm, uh, and we're supposed to be locked down, but you can here legally take a walk if you stay away from people. 
Uh, and when I do, I wear a mask, even though in the number of people I see and the circumstances, I don't think that the masks are much help because nobody's near me and nobody's coughing. Well, on the other hand, I think it's a good message to send. For example, if our president wasn't an imbecile, <laughs> uh, he would wear a mask on his campaign appearances just to help make it a norm in our society. Yeah, set a good example. He might mess up his hair, though. The same reason I wouldn't collect butterflies, even if they were an important population that I was studying, if it was in a national park, unless I had permission and could do it someplace where no other people would see me. Because it's not a, even if it's legal, it's not a good message to send to be collecting anything in a national park. So you brought up the coronavirus pandemic, and I don't really want to dwell on it too much, but it would be a crime if we didn't uh, give you a chance to, to comment on that because you're a biologist, you've got a lot of expertise in that area, you've written about it, and you know the brightest people on the planet. So what do you think is worth noting about the pandemic that we're in the middle of? Well, I think there's two things that are worth noting. One in the short term, and that is in the situation which we have now gotten ourselves into, I don't know a single person, virologist, epidemiologist, so on, that I, I know a lot of them. I trust them all. Everybody says the same thing. We desperately need a national shutdown and ordered from the top, and we desperately need uh, somebody in charge who doesn't happen to be an imbecile, which are the ones running it now, to make sure that we get the testing kits and the protective stuff out there right now. Don't tell me it can't be done because I remember December 7th, 1941, when our country was up to that time, I think it built almost 4 million automobiles. And after December 7th, 1941, we quickly switched the automobile manufacturers to making tanks. Uh, and I can remember collecting milkweed pods, the food plant of the butterfly, the monarch butterfly that I worked on intensively to get the fluff out of them to make stuffing for life preservers for the Navy. And we rationed all sorts of stuff and so on. There was real leadership. The country was mobilized. And now we're having been run by a really stupid, narcissistic, evil imbecile who is not doing any of the things that need to be done. Now, you may think of that as a political statement. It sure as hell is. We have, <laughs> because the second thing is that we are facing a whole series of existential threats that you and we and many other scientists have warned about for decades and doing nothing about it. In fact, Trump is now loosening the cafe standards in order to get his businesses more profits or the businesses of his buddies mm -hmm. more profits at the cost of killing many, many, many people in the future. Because if you think the health problems of this virus pandemic are serious, they're nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the health threat of climate change. There's no chance, as far as we can tell, that this particular coronavirus will kill everybody. But climate disruption can kill everybody. And we have very little time to act. And instead of acting in the right direction, this moronic imbecile is working very hard to kill Americans and other human beings in the future for his personal gain and profit. So why do you think the coronavirus pandemic has captured attention like climate change should have and hasn't yet? Well, I think people can relate to it more readily. After all, their parents are dying, their friends are dying, the news is covered with it, it's global. It's one of the interesting advantages of the web and the level of communication we now have so that everybody who at least can turn on a TV or turn on a computer knows to a degree what's going on. The sad thing is, of course, the bad planning of the entire world, listening to the idiots in economics who talk about things 
like perpetual growth, you may have heard of that, <laughs> uh, or comparative advantage. You know, comparative advantage is why we don't have a good supply of respirators now, because to the comparative advantage thing is spread production all over the world to wherever the rich people who run the world can find the cheapest labor. So the parts are made everywhere. If you then have a thing like this that breaks down, starts to break down the international movement system, all of a sudden you can't get respirators made easily. I yelled about this a long time. One of my favorite places is Costa Rica. And they gradually moved away from growing food to take care of their population to growing cash crops for China and U.S. and so where. So if the transportation system based on fossil fuels we shouldn't be burning breaks down, the Costa Ricans may have trouble feeding themselves. The whole idea of comparative advantage has been on efficiency rather than distribution. It was put forward originally by Ricardo at a time when they thought that capital was nailed in place because capital was largely land and labor could move around. And we've now got exactly the opposite situation. You could move a trillion of your dollars to Arizona or Australia in a nanosecond now. I wouldn't do it. I'd hold on to your trillion dollars. <laughs> but you can't move the labor that fast. So how did I get on that rant? Uh, we didn't do the planning and we're not doing any planning now. I'm trying for the world record of rejected op-eds with my colleagues, trying to point out that this is a blip, but what's coming down the road, not just in climate disruption, but also in toxification of the planet, in destruction of soils. You know, a lot of people don't realize how much of their food comes at a distance. Many years ago, John Holder and I did a little calculation of how many Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs it would take to destroy either the United States or the Soviet Union then uh, as functional entities. These are small bombs, 15 kilotons roughly. And we figured about 12 would do the United States and about nine would do the Soviet Union because all you have to do is bring down the electricity grid and hit the transportation centers like mm -hmm. Kansas City and Chicago and so on. And most people would just starve to death because, you know, the fo whole food supply is based on supply chains that are spread around the world and very, very vulnerable. There's not much food stored anywhere now. The system has to keep working. And the pandemic, of course, is likely to disrupt that system. Paul, I'm um, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed to say that I just barely started reading your book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, very. It's ancient. It's it's wonderful, and I love it so much. I'm almost done with it, and I'm kind of glad that I haven't finished it yet, just because I get to talk to you. But Dave and I have been talking for over a year about getting you on our podcast, and I've just been really, really excited. So so she has no excuse for not finishing the book. By I now. know, I know. You know the book that you just showed me? Yes. Pick it up, and look, I think, in the lower left-hand corner uh -huh. of the front page, front cover, what does it say? There's a little diagram. It says the population bomb keeps ticking. Uh, is the bomb ticking? Yes. No, it isn't. It's got a fuse. <laughs> Nobody has ever noticed that. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> the oh. population bomb fuse is still burning, but it's not ticking. <laughs> okay. Well, that was because they hadn't invented clocks yet when you wrote that book. Yeah, that's oh, right. God, no. <laughs> it, was, it was an hourglass. The sand is still drifting, yes. It's a classic. <laughs> but, she's, you know, we're obviously talking about the population bomb, and that might be one of your least favorite subjects, Paul. But let's talk about it for a minute, because your name doesn't appear in print. You're never introduced without the name of that book. Yeah. And I just have to ask you, after more than 50 years, are you just sick of that? Because you've written over 40 books, 
and over a thousand papers. I'm only sick of it in one sense. Well, a couple of things. First of all, Anne wrote it with me, but Ian Ballantyne said that the book will sell better if it only has one author. Uh, and I was young and naive, but also in a sense, right to go along with that, although I am ashamed of having done it in a certain dimension. That's one. Why? Why? Why only one author? It just turns out to be true. And you can see how they associate it with if you, uh, they always like a single author on a book if they can get it and they want to build that name. It's just a marketing thing. I don't know if they, the publishing industry never takes data, so they may be wrong, but that's what everybody said. And the book did sell something like 3 million copies. So whatever. Yeah. But the other <laughs> thing is that, People seem to think that a scientist always believes exactly what he or she said 50 years before. And that, of course, isn't true. And there are a lot of things I would, have, would do differently and have done differently in other books since then. And the worst mistake we made was to put in scenarios, which are little stories to tell uh, that may help you think about the future. But every reviewer treated them as if they were predictions. Mm -hmm. right. And um, I would not do that again. But overall, the book did what Ian Ballantyne and Dave Brower of the Sierra Club were the two people who asked us to do it, mm -hmm. did what we hoped it would do. And that is it brought the population issue into the environmental movement when it was more or less starting up big time after Rachel Carson. I have to say, they're very clearly stated as scenarios, hypothetical scenarios, not predictions at all, because you have many of them. You're <laughs> like, <laughs> you're just the fact that people review and don't read the book or lie about it. You know, somebody told me even a president of the United States can lie. So <laughs> you can't trust everything. You got to remember, I mean, I might be a paid agent of the contraceptive industry. You know, you can't trust me. Maybe there's no population problem at all. You, you got to figure things out for yourself. But you do say you forecast that environmental change are just strong efforts towards mitigating some of the issues with, I guess, mainly pollution at the time was something that you were writing about. It's kind of unlikely that unless some economic shift were to occur, we probably won't see strong efforts towards mitigating these issues. And that's kind of where we're at today. You know, COVID sort of has the bull by the horns and it shifted our entire economic system in a way that's clearing our skies and kind of making room for other species to come out again. And it's kind of the silver lining. So unfortunately, it's, you know, there's there's a lot more bad than good right now. But do you think or are you hopeful that more people will use this time to just think about the relationship between or our relationship with the earth to try to prevent this sort of thing from happening again, rather than just accepting the inevitable that comes with no changes being made with regards to population growth. That's why my colleagues and I are fighting for that prize of being the people to write the most and have rejected the most op-eds in a brief period of time, because we have very little time. And unless people learn the lessons from this. After all, pandemics are so tightly tied to demography that to have a pandemic and not discuss population issues is absolutely insane. But we have an absolutely insane society. The New York Times can't ever bring itself to really deal well with population because the people who own it have this as, you know who Noam Chomsky is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Read what he wrote some time ago about the U.S. media and so on. There are very strict limits within which you can have debates. And one of the things you can't seriously discuss is what is desperately needed, namely a total revision of our economic system, reversing the last few hundred years of making money the basis of everything. After all, what did you hear when the idiot gets on his afternoon show and says we got to open up the country because we got to get the Dow up. It's the death or the Dow yeah. syndrome. 
We want to go back to super consuming. We want to go back to population growth. And this is followed by everybody. Even people as smart as Obama won't say that we have too many people. We're growing too fast. That is a major factor in our vulnerability to pandemics and on and on. We don't hear any discussion of, for example, the more and more crowding of human being into what's left of natural habitats and close connection with the other organisms, animals, that are the sources of virtually every infectious disease humanity has ever gotten. You know, that's where they come from. They're diseases of animals in general, and we're animals. And the more people we put in contact with them, the higher the chance is of a transfer. People don't know, for example, that measles couldn't have invaded humanity as a whole until there were cities of something like 50 to 100,000 people. I don't remember the numbers anymore. You have to have large groups for a virus to get in and can stay in uh, unless if the group's too small, everybody will become immune. Uh, There won't be enough susceptibles left and the virus will die out. Measles probably got into human groups many times and just died out until we had such a huge population. Say the same thing for coronavirus. The size of the population makes a wonderful mass of biomass for any virus to invade. And we've managed by bringing uh, our domestics to huge levels, chickens, pigs, ducks, beef, camels, all of which make us more vulnerable to uh, pandemics. The Chinese pig, pond, duck, human system has long been known as a generator of nasty viruses, and it'll keep doing it. What do you think it'll take for people to actually have the courage to say something about it? You want the truth? Yeah. Nothing. I don't think there's a chance in hell that we will get the changes we need to keep civilization going. I hate to tell you that, but I don't see any sign of it. Again, the so-called leadership doesn't want to do anything that will cut into their money. It's strictly follow the money. What is it? One half of 1% of the population has, I don't remember exactly, but 50% of all the money. That's what runs things. You know, you have a fully owned Supreme Court. There are four people in it who aren't fully owned, but they're going to be replaced. We have a president who is building his own money all the time. What is the chance? Maybe I'd like to think if the Democrats took over, they could try and transform things. But I have to be honest with you. I can't be optimistic. On the other hand, I'm not going to stop fighting for it. What else is there to do? Right. You know, you're starting out young. I've got a plan, you see, to deal with this that you don't have. (laughs) Do I want to know what that is? Sure. It's called a funeral. I'll be 88 in May. (laughs) I'm going to die and leave it all to people like you. I had great hopes that I would die before the collapse really got going, (laughs) but I missed. The smartest thing I ever did was to be born in 1932. Second smartest was marrying Anne. (laughs) <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. Well, you should take credit for that. And I'm not asking this to argue, but are there any glimmers of hope today that you didn't see 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago? Well, 20 years ago, we didn't see the interest in the young people, the Greta Thunberg syndrome. And I think they're going to have to go to the streets. I think they will go to the streets. They may actually, you know, Trump has had the wiseness to note that gun shops and shooting ranges are essential, along with golf courses, <laughs> are essential businesses. <sighs> it's going to be nasty at some point. And, you know, my daughter lives near Washington, D.C., and I think the odds of me ever seeing her again are very, very small. I don't think that in my lifetime, I'll want to fly on a commercial airliner, my lifetime being, you know, 32 minutes or something at the moment. Wow. But remember, I'm a notorious pessimist. Me too. Let the optimists (laughs) get out there. And yet you never stop trying to help us get this right. What else can you do? (laughs) Yeah. 
you may have noticed that you're not getting the <laughs> growth mania to stop after all your years of trying. I haven't made any progress, I don't think. It's pretty sad. You got me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what's your background? I studied psychology in undergrad, so I didn't really have much of a background in environmental studies. I started getting more of an interest in it just in really starting with studying voluntary childlessness and trying to understand that and why it's important, why I I think the movement is important. And it sort of just turned into this more of a I guess, a personal choice that has global impacts. And then that kind of led me into finding Dave and listening to podcasts. And then I just sort of fangirled Dave and reached out to him and said, I want to be your new co-host. You need a new co-host. I don't have any experience, but can I try? (laughs) (laughs) You're doing a great job. I mean, if you're one of my favorite people is Lee Ross, who is a social psychologist who work with Kahneman and Tversky, among others, you probably don't know anything about them. Um, But uh, they're the people who showed how different responses were to the same question asked in different ways, which has got a huge political uh, element in it. And I actually, I recommend to you and your listeners, there's a great book by the second author is Lee Ross. Its title is The Wisest Person in the Room, if I recall correctly. And you would find it very interesting in the work you want to do because social psychology is a big element in why we're not getting the changes that every scientist thinks we should have in the world. And something to read when you're in your spare time when you're in graduate school with York. Fascinating subject. And yet we still haven't figured out how to really cut through the roadblocks and the inertia to keep us in place, huh? Yeah. You know, I should have thought to look up how many of the books you've written and co-wrote with you, because I know she's co-written a lot of the books. Yeah, most. Most of them? I don't know exactly. She goes off on her own track. She's been much more interested and active in working with environmental organizations and trying to keep the science straight there and so on. She's the brains and I'm the mouth. And in a sense, I'm the uh, book pusher. She takes the bad words out of the books. Uh, for the- Well, I hope you can talk her into joining us on this podcast one day, because I remember that you and she both were on the panel for the West Coast premiere of the Growthbusters film, and you were a great pair after that screening. Well, you, guess what? You got to lean on her, but she has voice problems and so on oh. and back problems. Shoot. Something happened to the gorgeous young woman. <laughs> I tracked down and married. I don't know what it was. <laughs> She's there. <laughs> you know, I, but I know what caused it because I was asking my colleague, Joan Roughgarden, I was just saying that interestingly enough, now my friends are mostly getting sick and dying. And 30 years ago, they weren't. And I don't understand why. And she said, well, I think it's probably climate disruption. <laughs> No. <laughs> it explains it. Is that what's happened to Anne, too, I think? Yeah, I should write an op-ed about that. So last book question, two-part question. So what is what do you think is the best book you've written, and what do you think is the most important book you've written? Well, in terms of the best book, I would say Human Natures, because it deals with the things that most people don't want to look at, you know, how we're dealing with things and why we do the things we do. The most important probably is the population bomb because it had the biggest impact. Second would be in that area would probably be eco science, which we did with John Holdren. And I know that Partha Dasgupta, the world's now best economist since our friend Ken Arrow died, he read it from cover to cover. He's probably the only economist who ever read that book from cover to cover. And he's now working very hard on things like, you know, he's calculated that the world might be able to support three and a half billion people at our present level. But I mean, that's his level of interest in population and so on. So that's, I guess, where I go. The things that mean most to me are the books I wrote on checker spot butterfly biology and a paper I wrote on butterflies very recently that just interests me. I must say the population problem 
is horrendous, but it doesn't interest me much because, as you can see, it's so obvious, it's so involved in everything that I don't get many eureka moments. I thought the nicest paper in that area was the one that Winus published with Winus, and I can't remember his partner's name, showing that if you had one fewer child, you saved uh, more greenhouse gas than persuading 24 of your friends to give up driving. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. We don't have a lot of time left. A couple things that I want to make sure we do. One is, you know, you were helpful in the uh, One Planet, One Child billboard campaign over at World Population Balance. And I want to thank you for your help with that. You gave us a good endorsement and even uh, made some recommendations that helped some people with a little bit of money discover us. Have you seen the results, Paul? No, not really. I want to just really quickly show you a photo. Can you see that photo? Oh, I knew what you were going to put up, yep. but I hadn't seen that. What's the city in the background? That's Minneapolis. That's downtown Minneapolis right there. Uh -huh. And yeah, it's something different. You know, we shared the design and everything, but to actually see that thing in the middle of the big city right next to Interstate 35W with no commuters on it, unfortunately, pretty stunning. How long will it stay up? It's been up for a month and we'll have to raise more money to do it again or expand it, you know, when the time is more right. You know, our timing couldn't have been worse. Well, look, yeah, I mean, no, <laughs> that goes for a lot of things, obviously. But one of the things that I find cheery is that, first of all, people in Dallas told you it won't work. Well, nothing works. We just have to keep at every edge doing everything we possibly can. And there have been some signs that all of our efforts are working. That is, population is now more in the news and more discussed than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, uh, We are not yet back to where it was in the late 60s, but it's out there and it's coming back. Whether it's coming back in time to do anything, who the hell knows? But we have no <laughs> choice but to keep going. And if you're interesting, brilliant young women, as you clearly are with Erica, that helps get the young people on board. Yeah. And what can I say? Good advice. Great advice. Paul, I have one last question for you. What are your top three ways of dealing with social isolation right now? I can tell you very simply, as long as it works. Anne and I have drinks before dinner with friends essentially every night via Zoom. Nice. And I talk on the phone to people. I think it's extremely important to keep your, we're very social animals. Uh, and it's very important to keep your social ties up. We're so vulnerable in terms of the demography. In, in your late 80s, both of us with underlying conditions, that we don't dare do any face-to-face -face stuff. But if we had a sane government, you could probably arrange a country in which face-to-face -face stuff done carefully and with lots of testing would work again. But again, we don't show the slightest sign that there's anybody actually in the entire administration with an IQ of over 30. Uh, it's quite <laughs> amazing. Uh, you know, how you got to hand it to Trump. He emptied out the executive branch of the United States. There are more empty suits there than one could possibly imagine. And uh, I... Don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you really think. <laughs> and one last question. When do you project that this whole thing will go back to what is going to be our new normal? I'll bet he's learned his lesson on making any kind of, giving any scenarios. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to hope that they can get themselves organized enough so that at this time next year, I will be, if I'm still alive, willing to meet friends in a restaurant under very careful conditions. As a pilot, I could get in an airplane, but I doubt if I will ever again fly in a commercial airliner. But who knows? I hope to be wrong. But so let's put it this way. 50 years of predicting the problems with virus epidemics, I wasn't wrong. So what the hell? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I am so sad that our time is up. Well, we can do it again sometime. I love what you guys are doing. 
say hello to York for me. He may remember me. I sure will. I'll be sure to share this episode with him. Um, okay. Thank you so much for joining us today, it's, Paul. It's been my great pleasure. Take care. Have a wonderful career. I hope I see you again before you finish your PhD. Same here. Okay. Stay healthy and say hello to Anne from us. Yeah, give our best to Anne. I will. Bye-bye. Take care. Well, Erica, I'm pretty sure that conversation with Paul Ehrlich will go down as a real highlight of your career, at least so far. Yeah, I think at the most really important time in history to get an expert like Paul to speak about this crisis that we're all in. Really, really great to have him on. I regret that we had to let him go after an hour because he had another meeting he needed to attend. And I'm not sorry I did this, but I really didn't steer the conversation too much. Uh, I really thought, thought it was important to just let him go where he wanted to go. But what that meant was I really never got around to saying, okay, Paul, where were you and what were you doing on the first Earth Day in 1970? And specifically, would you like to comment on how much progress we've had since then? How much progress we've made? Must be a lot of progress because there was so much prosperity. <laughs> so we didn't really get to do that. And it seemed like we ought to do that here on this special 50th anniversary of Earth Day edition of the Growth Busters podcast. But we didn't do that. I really enjoyed listening to Paul's personal story and how there was really like no outside pressure to censor himself. He was asking the important questions at the time. And I'm glad that he was rewarded for it. I'm so glad that Stanford gave him a place to speak his mind freely and openly. Yeah, you know, his outspokenness, you know, we talked about that in the conversation with Paul, because I had always wondered why uh, Stanford hadn't tried to rein him in. How did he manage to keep that job at that one university for all that time? But, you know, it turns out that his outspokenness is what got him invited back time and time again to The Tonight Show, because Johnny Carson was really afraid to bring a scientist onto the show. He was afraid that if he had a scientist on The Tonight Show, that it would be a dreadful bore. <laughs> and as you know, <laughs> there's nothing dreadfully boring about <laughs> Paul or like the guy. Not at all. <laughs> Not He's at all. <laughs> very entertaining. And so that's made him a great guest on The Tonight Show some 20 times, and it's made him a pretty in-demand speaker at uh, college campuses and all kinds of public events for 50 years. Yeah. And in fact, you're going to find this interesting, Erica. I was just talking over the weekend with David Trauger, who's uh, retiring from the board of directors of World Population Balance, and I mentioned something about having chatted with Paul Ehrlich a week or two ago, and Dave said, oh, well, if you talk to him again, give him my best. I don't know if he'll remember, but I introduced him when he spoke at Iowa State University back in April 1970 during Earth Week. Wow. Yeah, small world. Wow. Yeah. wow, really cool. Yeah, and at first I thought that he was saying that Paul Ehrlich was addressing the campus on the very first Earth Day at Iowa State University. And no, he was saying Paul Ehrlich was in such demand that uh, the best they could do was get him that week. But they had to move that speech from the auditorium to the armory at Iowa State University because there were so many people that wanted to come and see him. He was just so popular. And, you know, the book had been out over a year, and it hadn't gotten very many reviews. Uh, it hadn't really gotten the attention that the Sierra Club and Paul and Ann Ehrlich and Ballantine Books had hoped it would get. And it wasn't until Paul shared with us that Johnny Carson read the book and then wanted to have him on the show. Well, once he was on The Tonight Show, the book took off. That was when the book took off. And that was just a few months before that first Earth Day. I guess um, one thing I don't know is the Sierra Club was backing this book the whole time? Yeah. Funding or? I couldn't tell you. It could be that the book publisher, you know, was the only one that had to put any money into it. But David Brower was leading the Sierra Club. Which is really interesting because what was it, their winter issue where they sort of really downplayed the whole population aspect of all environmental problems. Now you're talking about recently, the November, December 
mm-hmm. 2019 issue of Sierra Magazine. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, the Sierra Club has changed a lot. Yeah, yeah, and chickened mm-hmm. out a lot. That's right. You heard it here first, <laughs> <laughs> not first. Sierra Club, where have you gone? What happened to you? Come back. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't managed to find exactly where Paul Ehrlich spoke during Earth Week, other than on uh, April 24th of 1970, he was at Iowa State University. Neat. Oh, and this is another interesting thing. Just before the first Earth Day, Paul Ehrlich was invited back for his second appearance on The Tonight Show. And he stayed on the couch and talked to Johnny Carson on the air for over an hour. Neat. Nobody gets an hour on the couch. The show's not 90 minutes anymore. Now it's 60 minutes, but that's just unheard of. So I want to remind you as we wrap up today that uh, the Growthbusters movie, free this week. So if you haven't seen it, this is your chance. Look in the show notes for a link or look at the Growthbusters Facebook page or search for the Facebook event page for the free Earth Day week Growthbusters screenings. Also, we are making the Growthbusters webinar series, which is normally behind a paywall. We're making that free for a week so that you can watch something pretty meaningful and informative while you're sheltering at home. And so see the show notes for that link as well. And I promised a little bit more detail. So I want to just tell you, there was this one period of time, 2016 to 2017, where we experimented at Growthbusters. We tried doing a series of webinars and they were really pretty neat and they were well attended, but they were a lot of work. The only reason that we didn't continue them was because donation revenue has not been and is not today high enough for me to be able to hire some staff help beyond having Erica co-host the the podcast. Just can't afford to hire the help to keep doing this kind of programming. So if you'd like to see more of this kind of programming and your name is Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, or (laughs) you don't even have to be that rich. It wouldn't take a lot, but that's why we didn't continue it. But there were one, two, three, four, five very interesting webinars. Overpopulation, the new conversation. Is the population taboo behind us? That was the first one. The second one, Paul Ehrlich was actually on the second one. It was called Solving Overshoot, End Overpopulation or Stop Overconsumption. That's great. Yeah. Third one was The Joy of a Steady State Economy. And Brian Check was on that webinar. Nice. Fourth one was Let's Talk Birds and Bees on Earth Day. And then the fifth one was called The Great Transition Initiative. These are all pretty interesting, so I'm really glad to make those free. So look in the show notes. Yeah, and these will be available on our show notes and also on the Growthbusters website. So you're better off looking for these on Facebook or definitely in the show notes for this episode of the podcast. Well, you know I will. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we're good. (laughs) That was a long episode. (laughs) All right. With a nod to Joe Rogan, who is the most listened to podcast and frequently runs his episodes three hours. So you can thank us for not going three hours. And thanks to our listeners. Thank you for your efforts to live more lightly on the planet. If you think this podcast is important, subscribe to the podcast on your podcast app, Apple or Spotify, and recommend it to your friends. As always, you can find us at growthbusters.org and search for Growthbusters podcast on Facebook, Spotify, and on your smart speaker. I'm Dave Gardner with Erica Arias reminding you that Friends don't let friends miss the real story on sustainable living. Thanks so much for listening. Some may dream to pay mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters.